It's the uh, most comprehensive search for signatures that might be coming from extraterrestrial technology. One of the things we've discovered as we understand more about the universe is that it looks more like us. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Mankind has always looked up into the sky and told stories about the stars. In myths and folklore such as Orion the Hunter and Taurus the Bull from the ancient Greeks, or the Wolf Trail of the Milky Way from Native American tradition, the stars in space have long captured the imagination of the peoples that observe them. Since 2016, Breakthrough Listen has been monitoring space, looking for radio waves sent from distant stars, seeking to confirm the existence of life beyond Earth by using tools such as NSF's Green Bank Observatory. Our guest today is David DeBoer, a research astronomer at UC Berkeley and project manager at Breakthrough Listen. Dr. DeBoer, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. So I, I like to start with a little bit of background as we get into things. How did you become interested in radio astronomy? Well, like most things, it wasn't a necessarily a direct linear route, but um, I, I always have been interested in the physical sciences. Even as a kid, I always liked physics. My favorite book was this, goop, this book about atoms and stuff um, and how the universe works. But, you know, I never really thought I'd go straight into astronomy, let alone radio astronomy. But I, I grew up in the high country in Colorado. And one of the, you know, it's a beautiful place. And one of the beautiful things is, are the skies. The stars are very, very vivid. The moon, you, know, you could reach out and touch it. So I have always appreciated the, the beautiful skies. And then, you know, I also like to understand how things work in the kind of the origin of things, you know, where did things start? I like, you know, like where did words come from and so on? Well, astronomy and astrophysics are kind of the ultimate in terms of understanding how things work and understanding our origins and the ultimate origins of the universe and humanity and, you know, things, important things like that. Right. And, and when you have that, that environment where the noise produ or the light pollution is low enough that you can really see the stars, it is very much different experience than being in a city. Yeah. Yeah. People don't realize, in fact, it, it can be hard to recognize the constellations in those, because we're in the city, you only see those stars and they're very, they just pop out. Whereas, you know, when you're out in the high country, there are so many stars, you can kind of lose track of where you are in the sky, but you can see the band of the Milky Way, which is fantastic. And I do get to go to observatories still and, and get to appreciate that, that view. Right. And then when, when you're looking through things, it kind of changes the context too. So I, I want to move into your work a little bit. Can you tell us what is Breakthrough Listen? Right. So uh, I'll break through this. And I guess, you know, first of all, it's the uh, most comprehensive search for signatures that might be coming from extraterrestrial technology. And I'm using the words a little bit carefully because um, in the past, we, we've typically called this endeavor SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And there, you know, we're kind of making some uh, inferences on what intelligence might be. But really what we're doing is we're looking for evidences of technology that we have the ability to detect. So uh, it kind of is an analog to biosignatures. We tend to call this field now technosignatures. You know, it's really been decades of work, and we are leveraging the pioneering work uh, at academia. You know, obviously, Berkeley has been a long player in that, the SETI Institute. I mean, SETI is in its name, um, you know, as well as NASA. You know, early on, NASA was big into this. Uh, the Breakthrough uh, Listen Initiative, though, is funded by the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, which is a, a private foundation, and they fund a set of what they call breakthrough initiatives with the goal of understanding you know, humanity's place in the universe, you know, looking for all of the fundamental big questions like, are we alone? That's what Breakthrough Listen does. Are there other you know, signatures of technology out there? Uh, are there other places that are habitable that we can detect? Um, you know, can we, the nearest star, in fact, has potentially uh, planets of order Earth-like around a star that's somewhat sun-like. Uh, can we get there? That's another initiative. Uh, you know, and, and actually kind of maybe particularly germane now, can, you know, what does that infer for us trying to cohabitate with other races, you know, other viewpoints and, and so on? Can you tell me about how you use something like the Green Bank Telescope? Right. Yeah. So uh, one of our goals is to use every telescope all the time. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, we think is going to be important to find these signals, which are going to be very likely, very elusive. If they're not, well, that would be amazing. We probably would have found one, but they're going to be very elusive signals. So we want to use all the telescopes all the time as much as we can. And so in some of these we use in the mode we call commensal, which means that another user uh, gets to use, uses these telescopes, point the, points them, picks the, the frequency that they're going to operate at and so on. 
And we hang on, you know, we we piggyback on that, or we call it commensal because that I, I guess that sounds better than piggyback. <laughs> um, and that's actually very, very effective, especially with these new arrays coming on online, like the SKA, but we use the Meerkat telescope. We're starting to use the very large array in New Mexico in this mode. Um, and that works because you can see a big chunk of the sky and we know where a lot of stars are. And we look around these stars. But we also like the ability to point very, very sensitive telescopes where we want to point them uh, for a few reasons. One, we want to follow up on things that might have flipped into our uh, consciousness, you know, by a signal we found that we want to follow up on. Or, you know, we're, we're scientists. We like to have hypotheses. So, you know, we want to come up with our own experiment and where we might want to look and point the telescope. So, yeah, so the Green Bank Telescope, or the, the GBT, is the world's largest telescope, let alone radio telescope. It's an iconic thing in our, our field. And so, you know, the ability to get to point that thing uh, and look at stuff that we want to look at uh, for a large, large chunk of the time is, is wonderful. And we've, uh, we have a very productive collaboration with the Green Bank Telescope people. And in fact, we've deployed the largest di uh, processor on the back of that telescope that can search, you know, really slice and dice the frequency up in very fine chunks. And you know, one of the goals we want to do is provide a benefit to other astronomers. So they are allowed to use our back end. We, in fact, encourage them to use the hardware we produce. And they also have produced important science. A lot of it relates to transient phenomena, things called fast radio bursts and so on. Um, and so it's kind of a great dual use. We get to use it. We've deployed it there. And we are excited that other researchers can use that uh, for other types of science. One of the, the interesting things about this Breakthrough Listen project is bringing together the different resources to get an amount of data that's very different from what SETI has historically had. Can you talk a little bit about the amount being collected through this endeavor compared to historically? Yeah, I, I mentioned that, you know, we expect that Techno signatures will be very elusive. And so really the goal is to look at a lot of places a lot of the time over many frequencies. You know, the mantra, we really all sky all the time, all frequencies, uh, you know, maybe we'll get there. But, but in terms of the amount of data that's collected and analyzed, we actually, it, it kind of spans from where in the, the system you're looking, you know, all the way from the raw data, which is the data that streams off the telescopes. And when we, for instance, when we work in these uh, radio telescope arrays, you know, we get more data coming off the telescopes than the worldwide internet traffic. Or, um, so we certainly can't save that. Uh, but we do process that, uh, you know, kind of slightly channelized version of that. And so we look through all this for these very fine signals that we don't think nature can make. You know, we, we understand nature pretty well. Uh, we think we've sorted out what it can make on its own without technology assistance. Uh, and so we want to look for these very uh, compressed signals and frequency and time. So to do that, we actually want to look in very, very finely sampled frequency and time space for signatures that pop out and that we don't think nature does. Um, so this, this idea of going from the raw data that we look through, kind of streaming off the telescope to slightly processed data that we look through in more detail to data we actually save and archive for future posterity and for future searches, it spans actually many, many, many orders of magnitude. Um, and one of the key goals of this project, though, is to actually get a large open source archive that people can use and the tools to download it. It's all very well to have data out there, but if <laughs> it's just a big chunk of data that you can't do anything with. Right. Uh, so we currently have about 22 petabytes of data. You know, petabytes are, are pretty big. Um, yeah. So of that 22 petabytes, we actually are excited for people to look at uh, chunks of it. And we have tools that can look at certain chunks of it. And if you go to uh, you know, Breakthrough Listen, uh, look for us on the internet, you'll find the tools and the search algorithms that you can use on that data. Very cool. So do you think it's it's an inevitability that you will find some sort of signal that seems to be manufactured or quote unquote alien life of some sort? Um, yeah, I guess it depends how far in the future you're, you're looking. Um, you know, w one of the things we've discovered as we understand more about the universe is that it looks more like us, right? We, we've always known there are a lot of stars. We know there are a lot of stars that look like our sun or that could support life or, or support, have the stability long enough for life to develop. Right. And, and one of the big revolutions over my career has been the planetary evolution. When I was in school, we knew of nine, then it was eight planets. And that was, that was the whole catalog. And now there are literally thousands and thousands of planets that we've discovered. And we've, you know, 
as the technology improves, we find more and more planets that are more and more Earth-like. So, you know, the chances of some sort of life developing on many of those and some sort of intelligent life seems to me uh, inevitable, right? The universe is is massive. It's not infinite, but it's huge. Uh, and you know, there are billions and billions of opportunities for life to develop. And it seems likely that even in our galaxy, which is one of billions and billions of galaxies, that we would there would be another technological civilization. Uh, but that said, the universe is very, very large, and even the nearest stars are very far away. Uh, and, and so detecting those signatures is going to be hard. Now, we have some positive news in that if you look at the loudest signals that humans can transmit and the, loud, and the quietest signals that humans can detect, we do actually have the technology to detect ourselves um, through a good chunk of our galaxy. You know, a quarter or, or even more of our galaxy, we could detect ourselves, assuming we knew where to look, when to look, and the frequency to look at. Um, in terms of detecting our TV, you know, I Love Lucy and so on, those signals are two things. One, they're much, much, much weaker. Uh, and also there's information content in them. So they actually get modulated. So they get spread out over frequency. Uh, and so it makes it harder because it blends in more to the background. So those are going to be very, very elusive. So, you know, initially we're essentially trying to target these deliberate signals that someone might be putting out either to be noticed. You know, some people like to be noticed. Uh, you know, everyone make, you know, it's like a, the ultimate TikTok video, right? They want to be okay. noticed and, and send something out there. But also we do transmit very, very strong signals for our planetary radar, right? We map the planets in our solar system with these very, very bright planetary radars. Uh, we have weather radar, much, much weaker. Um, you know, we're looking at sending, using lasers to, to propel light sails, which would be incredibly strong blasts of laser. And we're, we are starting programs to look at laser light, you know, in the optical and the infrared. So one of the other projects you've worked on that uh, NSF helped fund was something called CASPER. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, CASPER has been a, a multi-decade program that has been very successful. There's the literal acronym, which is kind of a cumbersome, uh, you know, as, as all astronomy acronyms are, uh, called the Center for Astronomical Signal Processing and Electronics Research. Um, and, and what this means is for radio telescopes particularly, which is kind of where I mostly specialized, it's really, we need fast computers to look at all that data coming off. Right, a radio telescope collects radio waves, which is electromagnetic radiation, just like light. But we can actually uh, download it and get it to data just like a radio, and then we can channelize it. So we want to process that data. And there's it's very broad bandwidth, very fast time cadences. So in the past, you know, before Casper, people would spend five or a decade to develop a, a specialized digital backend you know, re radio receiver for the telescope. And, you know, that's sometimes the life of a telescope. And, you know, you certainly want to not wait five years before you can adequately use a telescope. So what Casper has done is say, well, look, let's, let's leverage uh, what's going on in Silicon Valley and other places and use Ethernet and use all of the best tools and develop our own stuff that we then can port <clears throat> to radio telescopes. So that's been what it's done. It's developed boards, firmware, hardware, and so on. Well, now with the tools and our understanding of the early universe and the precision that we understand the early universe, we have the tools to make these telescopes that are targeting this period in the universe's life that we've never had access to. Uh, specifically, that's after something called that we call the cosmic microwave background, which I think you know, many people are familiar with. And it's it's really, it's quite amazing that we have this picture of essentially a day in the life of the universe as a baby. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, it, and it's incredibly precise, it's, which is remarkable. And then as you know, the universe developed galaxies and stars and black holes, we get a, a very increasingly accurate picture of the universe you know, as an adult. Uh, but this period of after, you know, as a toddler and primary school and high school and college, we had just have snippets of ex, you know, kind of exceptional periods of life. And so we really don't know the details of how it developed. How did, how did these structures start? How did the first stars and black holes and galaxies really start to formulate, uh, to, to form uh, at the cores of this dark matter? And we now have the technology and, and really largely leveraging all of the commercial technology out there to, to build these systems. So I've been very fortunate to have a couple systems in South Africa 
The, the first one was called Paper or the Precision of Array Probe in the Epoch of Ionization, <clears throat> uh, fully supported by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and it really took the field along a new direction of trying to target very specific uh, scales of the universe. Uh, and so we learned a lot from that array, and we got funded to build something called the Hydrogen Epoch of Ionization Array called HERA, which is a much bigger telescope in South Africa. These telescope is, is built in the, the northern, you know, sparsely populated region of South Africa in the Karoo, where the, uh, the South African government in, has seen, seen it fit to put a lot of amazing infrastructure that helps us. Now, of course, they did it for an international project called the Square Kilometer Array, but they've been amazing partners to support our activities on site for HERA, well, for, first for paper and now for HERA. So uh, HERA, was a, it's an experiment. We're in year six of ostensibly a seven or eight year project, uh, collecting more and more data as time goes on. And we're hoping that with data that of the season we just finished, we're hoping that we can actually start to get these first uh, pictures of the universe, you know, as a toddler, as a, you know, just kind of a, a day in the life of the universe in primary school. And, you know, as we all know, that's an incredibly formative period of our, of human's life. And that also is a very formative, uh, pun intended, formative period in the universe, you know, how it started and how it evolved. So we're hoping that we now have data in the can. It takes a year or more to process that data because the, the signals are, you know, a million times smaller than the background. Well, what we normally call the background signal. So we have to peel away about a million times a million parts of the signal to get the little nugget left. Um, so it takes a while. Um, and then we have two more seasons of observing and maybe we'll go forward and we hope to fill in that picture. Special thanks to David DeBoer for the Discovery Files. I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.